I'm Nick Salmond. I'm the director for the Center for the Study of the United States. Welcome to the Fall F. Ross Johnson Virtual Colloquium, uh, a workshop on precarity, lives on the edge, which sadly is even more relevant than it was a year ago. Uh, I think we're all experiencing uh, degrees of, if not our own precarity, of those around us. So I'm very much looking forward to hearing uh, this workshop and hearing what the panelists have to say. Um, I want to make an announcement about one upcoming event. Uh, on December 2nd from 3.30 to 5 p.m., the final of our fall graduate student workshops is happening. Stephanie Redekop will be delivering a paper on, called Facing the Facts, the Personal Essay and American Crisis Discourse in the 1960s. So uh, you can find information about that at our, our website. Please uh, register and come. I think it'll be a good talk. Uh, I would now like to offer uh, in place of reparations, the land acknowledgement. The sacred land on which we operate has been the site of human activity for 15,000 years. This land is the territory of the Huron-Wendat and Petun First Nations, the Seneca, the Mississaugas of the Credit River and the nations of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. It is marked by a history of settler colonialism and genocide as well as resistance. It is a site from which ongoing internal and external colonial projects are launched and extended even as their persistence and violence is erased in dominant accounts of this history, especially accounts of the present day. The territory was the subject of the dish with one spoon wampum belt covenant, an agreement between the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the Ojibwe and allied nations to peaceably share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. Two row wampum says we are going to live on this land together and respect each other's sovereignty. The dish with one spoon is an agreement that recognizes that we live off of the same resources. It is hard to eat a collective meal together off of a dish with one spoon. Hence protocols are put in place to ensure mutual respect and accountability to each other and to the land. Today, the meeting place of Toronto is still the home to indigenous people from across Turtle Island. Our intersecting communities are comprised of those native to this land, indigenous people from other territories, as well as settlers who have come here by choice, force or otherwise as a result of settler colonialism and imperialism. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission 94 calls to action reaffirms that the treaties with indigenous peoples must be lawfully honored. We are all treaty peoples and are responsible for honoring and upholding these agreements. We are grateful for the opportunity to work on this territory and to share space with all of you. And now uh, it is my pleasure to turn this over to Dave, Ted Sammons, who will introduce the panelists and to thank the panelists. I will, as I leave, thank the panelists for coming to speak with us today. I'm very much looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you, and over to you, Ted. Uh, thank you, Dr. Salmond, uh, and welcome everyone to our event. Thanks a lot for coming through. Um, and we have a really terrific event uh, to share with you today. We've got a great group of panelists uh, that, uh, but we do not have enough time for everyone to be able to adequately share with all of us uh, at any leisure what they uh, have brought to the table. So I'm going to be um, time sensitive and very, very quickly, uh, just I'd like to turn uh, the, the, uh, the microphone over to uh, Dr. David Petnikio, uh, who's one of, the, uh, um, one of the organizers initially of this event. And he will just do a real quick introduction of Dr. Cranford, uh, who will be our first speaker. What we will do is we will then offer a little bit more detailed bios of everyone uh, as we introduce them before they uh, provide the remarks. Uh, but just on my own behalf and behalf of the, my co-organizers, thanks a lot for you all coming through. Uh, I'm really looking forward to this. And uh, David, uh, if you would like to say a few words real quick and then uh, let's get started. Sure, um, I just wanted to thank everyone for being here. Uh, you know, we started this, uh, I don't know, Sherry, I don't know how long ago it was, but like a, probably, early, way before COVID and then COVID yeah. happened. <laughs> and then, so we had to postpone the, we had to postpone the workshop. And so we're so glad that we had the opportunity to do it virtually. And, um, you know, the, we, we thought a lot about the, the way that, what, what precarity means. And I can't think of a better time than now to talk about precarity in its various forms. So I'm really glad we have such a great group of scholars uh, doing different but related uh, 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 
research questions around this sort of big issue. And, um, and without further ado, I really would love to introduce my colleague, our very own uh, Cynthia Cranford. Uh, and she's going, to, uh, so she's going to be presenting on home care fault lines, uh, tensions and alliances across flexibility and security. And it's based on her new book with a Cornell University Press. Oh, I think you're muted. Okay. <laughs> thank you, David. And thank you, Sherry and, and uh, Ted for organizing this. This is, I'm really excited to be here and to be speaking on this panel on such a broad uh, range of issues related to precarity. So I'm gonna share my screen. And, uh, oh wait, sorry. A little technical. All right, this screen. <laughs> okay. So, okay, everyone can see my screen, okay? Yeah, the slides? Okay. So, home care is a window into the complexity of inequality and precarity. It also sheds light on the possible possibilities or potentials for challenging precarity. In my recently published book by Cornell University's ILR Press, I argue that in home care, understanding both tensions and possibilities for alliances is essential if the goal is to challenge complex inequalities. So several studies argue that alliances between home care workers on the one hand and elderly and disabled people who receive home care, on the other hand, are key to achieving both quality care and quality work. Yet my research shows that we also need to recognize and mediate tensions. If alliances are going to be able to tackle structural fault lines reflecting complex inequalities, how can we arrange home care to minimize tensions and maximize alliances? In the book, I answer this question by comparing how four government funded programs differ in the way they organize or arrange home care. I focus on the most personal in-home support that is paid help with daily activities like bathing and eating. Uh, and in this talk today, I'm gonna give an overview of my argument in the book and a peek at one of my case studies. So in the book, I use intersectional analysis and engage with scholarship on care labor, domestic work, aging, and disability in order to analyze how people who provide and receive home care are marginalized differently, shaping unique experiences and interests. They're located differently within various axes of oppression that form a complex matrix, to use Patricia Hill Collins concepts, Elderly and disabled people face marginalization vis-a-vis -a, -vis a state and society that values independence and devalues any form of dependence. Some people interviewed for this book had been in care institutions that cast them wholly as dependents, while others feared going into them. Still others lacked adequately funded support at home, resulting in their reliance on insufficient family health. In this context, elderly and disabled people desire flexible services to fit with their varying needs and they seek dignity. Home care workers experience a different face of oppression to quote Iris Marion Young, one defined by devaluation and lack of recognition within class and gender inequalities. Most of the workers are women, although, although there are some men, especially within disability support services. The majority of home care workers in the urban areas of rich countries are immigrant women from poor countries and in these contexts, racialization through nationality, language, accent, religion, culture, and or skin color infuses their economic insecurity. Workers thus seek both fair employment, contracts, and respect. So juxtaposing these experiences of elderly and disabled people on the one hand and workers on the other, I show how a tension between flexibility and security potentially exists across these home care programs that I analyzed. Yet my comparative analysis of four programs reveals dynamics that exacerbate or alleviate tensions. So I wanna just give you my argument in a nutshell in relation to some of the literature on precarious care work. 
I join others who find that insufficient government funding based on a narrow medical definition of need and delivery of care through market logic encourages employers to hire workers on precarious contracts. Narrow funding and market logic in turn reinforce gendered and racialized labor market inequalities. This represents continuity with longstanding racialized and gendered divisions of care labor as Evelyn Nakano Glenn argues. Racialized and gendered precarious employment also threatens the quality of services for elderly and disabled people. So building on this work, my analysis reveals how insufficient funding dovetails with gendered and racialized marketization to either erase traditional employers altogether or to discourage employers who are there from mediating tensions in the labor process, tensions between workers and service users and management when, when they exist. These are tensions about what is done, when it's done, how it's done. Inadequate funding coupled with marketization also makes collective action difficult, thus requiring innovative alliances. Yet I also show how a broader social funding model coupled with nonprofit delivery encourages more intervention to mediate tensions in the labor process. This is in part because these nonprofit contexts with broad funding facilitate workers and receivers collective representation. So I wanna just say a bit about the case studies before I go into a few details about the one study uh, in Los Angeles. My analysis rests on over 300 interviews revealing how a variety of players shape the conditions of home care in unique contexts. Over several years comprising four case studies, research teams interviewed workers paid to assist with daily activities and elderly and disabled adults who need such assistance. We also interviewed case workers who assign hours of service uh, and employers and senior disability and labor advocates, and we looked at documents from the programs. Two grants funded this work from the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada, and I want to recognize that support. Three of my case studies are in Toronto and one is in Los Angeles, and together they cover elder care and disability support. A direct funding program in Toronto serves disabled people focusing on physical disability, Funding here is shaped by the social independent living model of disability, which emphasizes non-medical assistance with a wide range of daily activities. The workers are employees of individual self-managers to use the program terminology, and they are usually called personal attendants or PAs. The funding is universal in that it's not means tested, although the Federal Canada Health Act does not guarantee personal support at home, but leaves it up to the provinces. Direct and individualized funding programs are also found in some parts of the US, Australia, the UK, continental Europe. Uh, my second case is attendant services in Toronto, which also provides provincially universal assistance to physically disabled people guided by the social independent living model. Unlike direct funding, however, attendant services are delivered through nonprofit agencies. So sometimes the service users are called clients, not consumers, given the formalization of independent living philosophy and agency-based social services. As in other contract agency models, which are found in some US states, the UK, and, and some parts of Europe, the consumers or clients are not the legal employers, but they direct workers who help them with routine daily activities. My third case, the home care program in Toronto, is also a case of a contract agency delivery model uh, but here the government contracts mostly with for-profit agencies. The home care program provides long-term care to elderly and chronically ill people, as well as home health care for those recovering for, from uh, acute illnesses. Yet government funding is based on a medical model that prioritizes acute over long-term care needs. So for example, help with housework is means tested in this program, but help with aging bodies is not, although it's severely cut back recently. Indeed, house, housework is implicitly equated with family work um, in this model. And here people are called clients and personal support workers usually. Finally, in-home supportive services in Los Angeles is also shaped by the social independent living model, even though the majority of people receiving it are elderly with a range of age-related uh, issues, including chronic illnesses. 
Uh, reflecting the general US context, this is a means-tested program funded by Medicaid. IHSS combines the independent living funding model with an explicit family model in that people, oops, sorry about that, in that people can pay their family members to be their providers. Okay, so what I wanna do now is give just a few highlights from the IHSS case in uh, Los Angeles. Okay, indicative of the US context, one has to be below the poverty level to receive IHSS. Reflecting the intersection of class and race in Los Angeles, people of color, including immigrants are overrepresented as both workers and service users or consumers within IHSS compared to their proportion in the overall population. Uh, almost half of those who use IHS hire family members as their paid providers. This is especially the case for immigrant communities uh, given uh, language and other barriers as well as cultural preferences. As one union organizer I interviewed described the program, it's poor helping the poor. Within IHSS, an alliance between labor and senior and disability movements, including the independent living movement, has provided collective support to both sides of the uh, care relationship. I argue that this case has potential for negotiating flexibility with security, but that there are also limits based in both labor organizing strategies and a neoliberal context. In IHSS, innovative legislation and organizing and coalition move towards a version of flexibility for consumers and security for providers at the labor market level. In contrast to the standard employment relationship modeled on the post-World War II factories, legislation for IHSS passed in the 1990s recognized multiple employers with influence over different aspects of working conditions. Three entities in particular were recognized as having responsibility. The consumer remained responsible for hiring, firing, and supervision, and this is in line with the independent living movement's politics. The state maintained its longstanding responsibility for assessing consumer need and thus setting the hours as well as paying the provider. But a newly created nonprofit organization called the Public Authority became the employer of record for the purposes solely of unionization and collective bargaining, collective bargaining with the state, with the government over wages and benefits. The public authorities also are mandated to offer consumer trading and they provide a registry to help consumers find providers and providers find jobs. Importantly, the public authority board must include some IHSS consumers as one disability advocate said, the new model gave voice to both workers and consumers. Passing such legislation required coalition between uh, the union, which was the Service Employees International Union and groups representing elderly and disabled people. Members of the coalition understood the alliance largely along social justice lines, although they recognized different positions of power. One disability advocate said something we had to keep straight was that we joined in coalition with the union in some of the things that will work for people with disabilities, but our positions are not coming from the same place. SEIU also made compromises to gain the support of the disability and senior movements, including giving up the right to strike. So this coalition and the new legislation and the new delivery model uh, that it achieved augmented worker security while maintaining the hiring and firing flexibility of consumers. The legislation moved away from the view that the workers were self-employed simply because no entity took responsibility as a single employer. Instead, it recognized IHSS workers as employees of multiple entities for different purposes. This also allowed for bargaining with the state over health benefits, better wages, which reduced turnover. In addition, the union developed what one person I interviewed called a sophisticated version of the hiring hall. So along with the public authority registered registry uh, that is mandated by the new program, the union's registry or the hiring hall uh, provides more options to find work and workers than in the past. But in the book, I also show that there are limits to the coalition's achievement of flexibility with security because there's little support for resolving tensions at the more intimate labor process level. 
So for each case study in the book, I analyze flexibility for service users and security for workers in the labor process as well as the labor market. So far, I've just been focusing on the labor market. The labor process is about negotiating what is done, when, where, and how. So one of the tensions I identified in my broader comparative analysis, I call the tension between time and task. So this is the tension between people's needs for help with various activities that change at different times uh, that aren't the same every day, every week on the one hand, versus a defined job description on the other hand at a stable time that workers might argue could prevent uh, care work from becoming personal servitude. So I'll give an example of family consumers and providers just to illustrate briefly this tension. Consumers with family as their providers said little about tensions in the labor process. They, they focused instead on problems if you hire non-family providers that either they or their friends hired uh, when family wasn't available. But interviews with, with the workers, the, the, the providers who worked for families uh, did talk about tensions. And so they suggest that there are tensions even with these extended family uh, economies. So for example, Lilia, one person that I interviewed who worked for her sister-in-law, she didn't think the pay was too low and she didn't have an issue even with working over her paid time. What she did have a problem with was uh, how her sister-in-law treated her in the course of doing her duties. So she says, even if I'm already working beyond my paid hours, it's okay. Um, but when the sister-in-law asked her to wash these large bath mats, she said, um, this is too heavy. I wash this so many times, throw it out, just buy a new one, I'm too tired. This is what maids do, please, not too much. So some people talked about how they didn't wanna work for family or how they no longer worked for family because of such tensions over what the job entails. Few providers thought the union was or would be effective at addressing tensions in the labor process. While Lilia mentioned these tensions with her sister-in-law, she had not gone to anyone at the union for support or talked to other union workers. She said, you know, for the clients, I'm not sure they help out. I'm not sure the union helps out. This viewpoint was shaped in part by a notion of unions as engaged only in confrontation and the difficulty of reconciling this with her relationship with her sister-in-law. I don't have a reason to fight, she said, because I'm taking care of a family member. Yet her view of the union was not just based on this kind of familialism, it was also due to the lack of the union organizing in her community. In her words, I don't know, uh, I don't know them. All I do, all I receive is a paper, so I just read about them. So in the book, I argue that the state's reliance on filial duty, ethnic community, glosses over tensions in the labor process. And I argue that such tensions, if unrecognized, could undermine consumers' labor market flexibility. That is their choice in hiring. Even though we have this innovative legislation that has brought more security at the labor market level in terms of hours, in terms of income. This underscores the need, I argue, to move beyond relational negotiations among family, co-ethnics, friends, to alliances that also tackle tensions in the labor process. In fact, none of my four case studies achieve flexibility and security at both the labor market and labor process levels. So in the last probably minute that I have, I wanna step back to discuss how we might achieve flexibility with security at these multiple levels. So in the conclusion of the book, I chart the potential for flexibility with security through comparative analysis in dialogue with other studies and also some on the ground practices by workers and service users and their organizations. Home care brings together the worlds of labor and social service, complexly interlocking inequalities of race, class, and gender with those of age and disability that are experienced differently by workers and people in need of services. In order to reflect the unique realities of this work, I argue that we need an intimate community unionism. Intimate community unionism would entail democratic alliances between labor and groups of elderly and disabled people to address tensions in the labor process and more structural fault lines at the labor market and state levels. First, we need coalitions to push for a universal social funding model, as many people have argued. 
Second, we need culturally sensitive labor market intermediaries. Intermediaries are like registries that connect workers to multiple jobs and link people in need with multiple workers. Labor market intermediaries provide people options beyond staying in jobs only for economic survival and keeping problematic workers out of desperation. However, if we are to ensure that tensions are not simply displaced to the labor market through firing and quitting, we need a third piece. We also need to recognize tensions that stem from different locations of workers and service users within a matrix of inequalities and balance the needs of both. But how do we do this? Given the bureaucratic tendency of even the most innovative unions, in the conclusion, I point to community-based labor organizing for inspiration and community-based organizing among immigrant groups as well. However, uh, I argue that overall, this comparative analysis shows how democratic alliances between home care users, home care workers, their organizations and allies are key to creating the social awareness and political will necessary to make multi-level systemic changes that would hopefully move us towards both flexible quality care and secure quality work. So thank you, I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Cynthia, for that talk. It was great. I'm so glad to get to hear more about your book, uh, especially since we haven't seen each other in a while. Um, but thank you. Um, I just wanted to note um, before we uh, move on to um, uh, um, Pamela's uh, uh, talk that we, we will have Q&A at the end. Uh, I'm, we do have a um, Q&A chat window where you can type questions and People can either, panelists can either uh, address the question live, I think, and or by typing. Um, but I think we could also use, I mean, depending on how it goes, there's also the raise hands function when in the participants window. And, uh, I, you know, my, my objective is purely to make sure that everyone who has a question or comment has an opportunity to raise that. So I'll, I'll be monitoring that, but please do, um, I mean, feel free to use either and I'll, um, I'll, I'll make sure to watch. Uh, as best as I can. Um, but on uh, that note, I'd like to introduce um, uh, Pamela Hurd, who's a professor of, of uh, public policy at Georgetown University. And um, her talk is titled Administrative Burden, Precarity and Public Policy, which draws from themes from her book with um, Donald Moynihan called Administrative Burdens, Policymaking by Other Means with Russell Sage. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Pam. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, let me uh, share my screen here first. Uh, okay. And okay, so yeah, what I'm gonna talk about today is administrative burden or effectively the kinds of um, barriers that we encounter when we interact with government. Um, and in, in an era of precarity, um, and how these administrative burdens, these like challenges we face, these bureaucratic hurdles we face when we interact with government, um, really undermine government um, effectiveness uh, at reducing precarity. I'm going to focus on the social welfare state today, but this uh, general topic is definitely applicable to other, or is applicable to other domains. Um, so let me start by. Um, talking about Meryl Mayo, who's featured in the picture here. Um, she lost her husband in the World Trade Center. Uh, in the days following his death, she spent countless hours finding out what financial resources she was eligible for, filling out forms, pulling together documentation, documentation, and effectively dealing with officials who offered varying levels of help and sympathy. She commented, you know, everything was scattered all over the place. And then I thought about all the things I had to do and all the laundry that was overflowing from the hamper. And I felt so overwhelmed, I just sat down on the floor and cried. Um, yet Mayo remembered one application process as being refreshingly simple. It was social security. She just made a phone call, filled out a simple form online, um, and she had effectively uh, applied for the program. There are actually ways in the US, you know, this is a program, it has 1200 offices around the country where you can get help, you can do it online, you can make a phone call. And in fact, the first social security checks to victims' family members were mailed out on October 3rd, 2001. 
And just as an aside here, um, people are not always familiar with this, but Social Security actually delivers an enormous amount of money to the um, uh, to, to survivors. It's effectively a social insurance program, so it's not just for retirees. Um, this is a, a, a simple example of how we want government to work. A public agency offers a help offers a helping hand at a moment when help was desperately needed. Um, but all too often, our experience with government is the opposite, characterized by confusion, delay, and frustration. Um, the, the point about administrative burdens and what I'm going to try to do today is talk a little bit about the role of politics and inequality um, and how these burdens affect, uh, effectively um, undermine um, uh, key policy goals for policies explicitly intended to reduce inequality. So why the why administrative burdens? It's not like um, anyone would be unfamiliar with the idea of bureaucratic red tape, and it's not like there weren't in varying domains um, in scholarly work that this hadn't been addressed. Um, but there's there, there were some sort of key things that have been missing in the existing literature, which is part of the reason why we wrote the book. Um, so, and I'm also in a policy school, giving a talk for giving a talk here for a policy school, and I'm in a policy school. Um, so these are kind of the perspectives most relevant. Um, so traditionally, like neoclassical economic theory effectively didn't really acknowledge burdens. So this would have been the literature maybe 30, 20 years ago, where effectively the idea was if people didn't say enroll in a program, they didn't enroll in a program because the paperwork was onerous or they couldn't figure it out. It was just trade-offs basically. So it was a rational response. Um, I think the shift towards behavioral economics and the uh, reality that people always don't don't always behave rationally <laughs> um, opened up the idea that there's sort of more to it than that, um, and that in fact people it's very reasonable pr to presume that these kinds of administrative burdens um, under undermine policy and program effectiveness. And there's a huge literature on it now. The limitation in this literature, though, is really around. Um, politics and the role of politics um, in shaping these burdens. And to some extent, I think, in terms of really understanding the um, inequality implications of these burdens. Public administration um, effectively, historically at least, really focuses more on bureaucrats than citizens um, and, and historically didn't focus quite as much on kind of bureaucrat, bureaucratic citizenship relationships. Um, it's also a literature that hadn't, um, or a field that had until I think more recently, um, thought a ton about inequality per se. Sociology is actually really the domain where I think you would have seen the most of this work. Um, the, the trick though in sociology was a lot of this was concentrated in um, the welfare literature, lit basically the literature around means-tested programs. Um, and so it's a really uh, rich, uh, really important um, literature kind of addressing this, addressing implications for inequality. But I, um, but part of what we conceptualize is that this that narrow focus basically limits our understanding of the ways that burdens in totality actually affect inequality. Um, and so part of this too was, I'll be frank here, was a applied as well um, in terms of giving people a language to talk about it. So I'll explain the kind of components to it in a minute. Um, but I have found over the past uh, year, year and a half, in terms of talking with, um, for example, people who work in policy organizations who actually deliver services, implement programs, um, they intuitively understand that this is a huge problem. But what they did often say to us after we kind of, uh, after I give a talk or whatever, is, say, is would sort of say, you know, it's just really helpful to have a language to actually talk about this. Um, and, and that was part of the point of what we were trying to do. Um, and also to think about it, I'm mostly going to be talking about social welfare policy here, but the point is this is not just in welfare policy or social welfare policy writ large. Um, we see this applied, for example, around voting, right? Claims about fraud, which justify the politics here, claims about fraud and the justification to erect a lot of barriers to voting. Um, abor abortion and reproductive health policy is another domain in the U.S. where you see a lot of this. So it's it's kind of across government, not just within social welfare policy. Um, so again, this is the basic idea here is that indiv individuals experiencing this policy implementation as onerous and effectively costly. Um, another key part here is this part about politics by other means. So part of it's, this isn't always the case, but it is not unusually the case that, in fact, burdens are used to get around either judicial processes, like in the case of um, uh, uh, 
waiting periods to access an abortion or um, in to get around um, legislative processes, for example, in the U.S. around um, health insurance. The Trump administration worked pretty hard to try to um, uh, get rid of Obamacare, actually both judicially and uh, legislatively. But the only mechanism by which they really did hinder the program was via the executive branch and via these burdens. Um, they did a whole host of things um, to just make it harder for people to access the program. Um, and, and finally, a key part of this is that it really is an important mechanism by which um, policies shape inequality and redistribution. Um, so we tend to, I think, on average, think about policy design more at the, at, the, at the upper level kind of policy design when we, especially in a comparative perspective, actually, in terms of thinking about impacts on inequality. Um, uh, but this is also a really important domain where policies actually shape inequality. Okay. So the first component in terms of just defining the concept um, is that there are learning costs, basically. And this is the, the process that, processes that people engage in, the search processes to figure out about a program, to figure out whether they're, um, uh, how to access it, what kinds of things that they need to do to prove that they're eligible, all of those different parts of trying to just figure a program out. Uh, why all of a sudden, sorry, there we go. Um, and, and the first example I'm going to give you of this is actually the Medicare program in the United States, not in Canada, right? So this is our public health insurance for people age 65 and older. Um, and this is a social insurance program. So it's a program we don't typically think about as being burdensome. But over the past 20 years or so, Medicare has be, in the U.S. has become increasingly privatized. About, uh, you know, 30, a third of beneficiaries are actually fully in a private health insurance uh, policy. It's funded by the government, but they're insured by a private insurer. And most of the remaining Medicare beneficiaries have some supplemental private insurance. It's a highly privatized program at this point. And the privatization has in introduced a ton of burdens into the program. Every time people, every year theoretically, in order to kind of um, make sure you have appropriate health insurance coverage and make sure you can access services that you need to and make sure that you're not paying more that you can, than you can afford to, you need to effectively look across hundreds of different options. Um, and and even if you could, you know, figure out across hundreds of different of options which policies would work best for you, that's also contingent on your own health remaining stable across the year. So in this way, it introduces an enormous amount of confusion. And then going forward, once people pick a plan, introduces a lot of precarity throughout the year. Because what if you made the wrong choice effectively? Um, so that's an example of learning costs, though. It's like the entry into is, is really um, negatively, negatively affected by these learning costs. The source of the politics here, though, is really more about marketization and privatization, right? Like this is um, the more confusing you make these programs, the better it is for private insurers, precisely because you won't pick the most efficient plan. <laughs> and that means they can kind of maximize their uh, profits off of it. Uh, the second domain are compliance costs, and these are like the base, the things that we often think about, which are like just following the administrative rules and requirements, collecting the documentation, filling out the forms, doing all that sort of stuff. Um, and the example, I'm going to give you another social insurance example here, which is unemployment insurance. So this is obviously unemployment insurance in the U.S. Um, unemployment insurance has really devolved. It is a federal state partnership. Um, but states have a profound, enormous amount of control about how these programs are designed. They are um, extraordinarily con confusing to navigate because they're entirely different across different states. Um, the uh, uh, kind of the process varies across states and how difficult it is in terms of the compliance cost of doing everything that you're required to do to both get on the program, but importantly, to stay on the program. And this sort of blew up, of course, during COVID. Um, and the, the kind of um, uh, highlight of this was uh, Florida, although it wasn't just Florida, Wisconsin had a similar dynamic, where for the prior eight years, Florida had been clawing back its 
UI program, and a main way that they clawed back the program it was basically by um, introducing administrative burdens, and everyone was super explicit about it. So the current governor of Florida, a Republican, referencing the prior governor of Florida who actually implemented this, right, like talks about this. He describes this is he describes the process of what they did as uh, let's put as many pointless roadblocks along the way, so people just say, oh, the hell with it, I'm not going to do it. Um, it was definitely done in a way uh, to lead to the uh, least number of claims being paid out. So everyone really acknowledged this is they they explicitly built these program these burdens into the program so that it would people wouldn't be able to access the program. Um, this is um, Abel Sewell. Abel Sewell, another example of the kind of compliance costs that people encounter. I'm sorry. Yeah, I knew I skipped a slide. Okay. Um, the last category of costs, and this is another area where I think the existing literature probably hasn't delved into enough in terms of trying to understand, are the psychological costs associated with these burdens. So this can be something that people have talked about traditionally, for example, around means-tested programs, like it's the stigma of applying and the stigma of being on benefits. Um, but there's additional things, loss of autonomy, stress, the kind of uncertainty it raises for people um, when they're trying to navigate these processes. So a very explicit example here that I'm going to give you is Abel Sewell. He's um, a boy in, uh, who was on Medicaid in the state of Tennessee. Um, he's a leukemia survivor. He was in remission um, and had fairly expensive treatments uh, for uh, blood treatments he needed to keep getting, though. Um, and he was on Medicaid. He was on um, the Medicaid program for children in uh, Tennessee. Now, uh, Tennessee, though, part of being on a program like Medicaid is actually staying on the program, not just getting onto it. So he'd been on it, but he got kicked off it. And his family had no idea why. One day he had Medicaid benefits, and the next day he just didn't. And it turned out the reason that he didn't is because the state had sent out to everyone on Medicaid, they'd sent out this 40-page form that you were required to fill out and mail back. Um, and if they didn't receive it, if you missed a few questions, um, they didn't contact you, they didn't do anything, they just kicked you off the program. And in fact, in the process, they kicked somewhere over a two-year period, kicked somewhere around um, 200,000 children off the program, uh, the largest share of children kicked off Medicaid um, in the country. Um, so this is another example in terms of precarity, precarity and kind of psychological costs, right? Can you imagine having a kid um, who really needs consistent, reliable medical care, and one day you have it, and the next day you just don't? Um, and people are experience this on a regular basis in these programs. They're sort of never really sure that they are, are going to consistently have access to a lot of these programs. And it really is a function of these kinds of burdens that are embedded in them. It's also important to note the ways in which these programs are tar that these uh, uh, burdens are not sort of um, randomly distributed. Okay, there's certain populations that are subject to them more than others. It's a primary means, frankly, um, by, by which we um, uh, institute kind of, uh, it's primarily distributed, for example, by, by race, by gender. Um, these burdens are disproportionately um, uh, experienced by certain groups. Um, but it's also important to note that in, individual people tend to experience them right like at higher levels. So, um, a lot of prior literature would think about burdens in terms of um, a particular program, like the burdens in the Medicaid program or the burdens in the SNAP program. But the reality is people um, who experience these burdens experience them across multiple domains. So that's what this quote is sort of getting at, right? Like a, a, as a low-income individual, she has all these different programs from child care support to WIC to SNAP to um, you know, all these different programs, and she is constantly in a state of having to navigate those burdens to make sure that she can stay on the pro stay on these programs and get access to critical benefits. Um, so in conclusion here, um, I, I just want to sort of reemphasize the degree to which burdens play uh, a pretty large role in shaping patterns of redistribution. Um, and they really do add a certain level of precarity to individuals' lives. So, for example, for um, uh, even targeted social welfare programs um, that are intended to offset uh, precarity, or social insurance programs like UI, which they're very, especially social insurance programs, they're really designed to protect against risk, to reduce this kind of precarity. Um, these programs actually introduce it 
um, and they, they certainly fail to mediate it, and they, in certain ways, introduce more of it into people's lives. Um, you know, the solutions to this, I didn't have a solution slide. I, as, you know, I do have, a, I do have um, numerous thoughts on, on how we address them. What I would say big picture, though, is I think part of the point is there's a wealth of literature now. Economics actually is really doing an incredible job in terms of like documenting where these exist and how they play out for people and that sort of thing. But actually, in some ways, it's the political stuff that I think matters more because it's in, in many in many places, not in all places, it is a question of politics in terms of addressing the politics to figure out how to actually reduce them in practice. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Pam. That was great. Um, I um, I want to move on to our next speaker. Um, uh, Michelle Morado, who's associate professor at uh, Associate University of Alberta. Um, she's also a uh, uh, primary investigator in the um, uh, Great Canadian uh, Class uh, Project and uh, study. And she's also um, both Michelle and I have been working on a national survey of people with disabilities and chronic health conditions to sort of get a sense as to how they're handling the social economic repercussions of COVID. So um, without uh, further ado, I would like to turn this over to Michelle, who's going to talk about uh, her talk is titled The Great Balancing Act, Households, Debt and Economic Insecurity. All right, uh, thanks so much, David, for that introduction and thanks for having me here today. Let me just share some slides with you. So today we're all here to talk about precarity. That's a term that's become widely used, but it's still often hard to define as we've seen with a lot of the talks so far. Uh, for me, when I think about precarity, I tend to imagine a car teetering off a cliff. Someone just barely holding on, close to using, losing it all, and in a super insecure situation. Hence the photos from these scenes from Jurassic Park that you see up here. Now, there's a lot of things that can make a person's situation more or less precarious. So how steep is that cliff? Do you have anything to hold on to? What's the fall look like? Where are you going to land? Are there dinosaurs waiting to eat you? Now, I can't speak for everyone, but I think that most of us are going to be able to avoid a situation like the one pictured up here. What many of us won't be able to avoid, though, is the increasing precarity across many areas of daily life. And I think that's something that COVID has made really apparent to a lot of us right now. So increasing precarity is evident in many different places. We see it in work and employment, and that's about more than just the growing gig economy. So it's in factors like deunionization, financialization, globalization. We see it in declining employer benefits for so many jobs. We see it in a weakening government social safety net and these increasing administrative burdens that we just heard so much about. We also see it in terms of individual safety nets where households have much less in terms of savings to rely on these days. And all of these factors are definitely connected to growing economic insecurity, which is the topic that I really wanna focus on in this talk for today. So how do we actually define economic insecurity? I'm gonna give you a few very specific definitions where economic insecurity refers to the degree to which individuals experience and are protected against large economic losses or the risk of economic loss faced by workers and households as they encounter the unpredictable events of social life. So with economic insecurity, we're thinking about protection and loss and how families deal with financial hardship and different adverse events. And really as a fundamental component of economic well-being, economic insecurity goes beyond basic measures of income and employment to really incorporate these aspects of risk and protection against loss. It also covers things like resource adequacy and the different factors that affect a household's ability to weather different hardships and survive different economic shocks. And overall, researchers have proposed multiple measures of economic insecurity. So some of these consider income volatility. Others consider experiences of adverse events. So what happens when you lose your job, get sick or get divorced. Others consider employment in precarious, temporary and non-standard work. Others look at resource adequacy more generally. So do you have enough to cover your expenses? 
And there are also a variety of studies that rely on more weighted indices that cover multiple measures. So these can include things like income losses, financial wealth and debt, out-of-pocket medical costs, and different perceptions of economic risk. Uh, in my earlier work, I spent some time looking at economic insecurity in several different ways by focusing on the conse consequences of adverse events for things like financial well-being and bankruptcy. More recently, I've been thinking about economic insecurity in terms of household structures, in terms of how it relates to disability and intersectionality, and doing this with some great co-authors. But what really remains key for me here is this connection between economic insecurity, wealth, assets, and debt, and how all these things begin to start to work together. So economic insecurity is very much tied to the many different components of wealth. And these include different types of assets and different types of debts. And I really want to focus on debt here because I think this relationship is really interesting, but it's also very complicated. And this is because of two key reasons. First, this is because debt can function to both increase and decrease insecurity among households. So the ability to access credit and take on debt really acts as a safety net. This can provide you as an important, an important cushion in times of financial instability. And debt can also promote things like asset growth. And so to actually take on debt, you need to have access to different lending institutions as well. And this is something that many households do not actually, actually have. Now, on the other hand, debt can also be a burden to carry. And it can potentially limit people's opportunities, especially when it gets out of hand. So we see that debt can both increase and decrease in security. And it's both a cause and a consequence of insecurity here. So depending upon how it's used and the broader economic situations of households, debt has the potential to affect experiences of economic insecurity in multiple ways. So households balancing high levels of debt, these are more likely to become insecure. And insecurity can also lead to households taking on more debt when they're trying to use that as a management strategy. So this is really gonna be the focus of what I wanna talk about today. So what I want to do is examine some experiences of economic insecurity, as well as the strategies that households use to deal with insecurity. And there's a few questions that I want to provide some insight on. So first, what do households do when things go bad and their spending exceeds their income? Or how do they, how do they actually respond to economic insecurity? Do these responses vary across secure and insecure households? And how are these relationships associated with broader household debt burdens? And here I really wanna focus on a situation where spending exceeds income. And that's gonna be my measure of economic insecurity for today. And I like thinking about it this way because it gives us some indication of situations where that balance is off. So it tells us about households potentially experiencing financial hardships. And I wanna look at, well, what do households do when this actually happens? So to do that, I'm going to incorporate some data from the 2019 US Survey of Consumer Finances. And this is a triennial cross-sectional survey of US households that's conducted by the Economic Research and Data Branch of the US Federal Reserve. And really, this survey offers us some of the best wealth data available in the United States. It has an N of close to 6,000 households for 2019. And I'm working across five imputed samples. So we have the Survey of Consumer Finances. In terms of some methods and measures, I'm going to incorporate some multinomial logistic regression models here. And that's because I want to look at some outcome variables with multiple categories. And I like these type of models because they allow us to compare the probability of membership in each category to the probability of membership in a specific designated reference category. And then if we start to think about this in terms of predicted probabilities, which is how I'll discuss some results today, they also allow us to look at the probability of ending up in any specific category net of all of our different factors in our model. So I'm gonna use these types of methods to look at three outcome variables. First, I'm interested in economic insecurity. And this variable includes three categories. So my first category is, did your spending exceed your income for the previous year? And these are insecure households. Was your spending equal to your income? Those are our somewhat secure households. And was your spending less than your income? These are more secure households. And then in addition to that, I also want to look at what households might do to deal with insecurity. And in this case, I'm going to look at actual insecurity strategies that insecure households used when they got into the situation where their spending exceeded their income, 
And I'm going to compare those to some hypothetical insecurity strategies that were proposed by more secure households for dealing with a potential financial emergency. And the three outcomes I want to look at here are whether the household borrow money, whether they spent from their savings or investments, or whether they did some other things. And this is a category that includes a lot of different strategies people propose. So they might have just fell behind on their payments, they could have cut back on their spending, or found a new income source within this other category. So I think this is really cool because it allows us to think about, well, what do insecure households actually do? And what do people think they would do if they were in an insecure situation? And one of the key things I'm going to connect this to is the household's monthly debt to income ratio, which I've broken into quintiles, five categories, where we're looking at people's monthly debt, debt payments and whether they were zero to 5% of their income, six to 12%, 13 to 19%, 20 to 29%, or greater than 29% of their income. And I'm also going to control for a lot of factors here. So things like demographics, education, earnings, and credit market access. So a lot of this is exploratory, and this is partly because uh, we know that debt is both a cause and a consequence of economic insecurity. But my goal here is to provide more of a picture of levels of insecurity and some of the strategies that households use to deal with it. So let's actually start by looking at insecurity over time in the United States based on this particular measure. So there's a variety of different ways we can measure insecurity. Here we're just thinking about this in terms of whether households had spending that was uh, exceeding their income. And we're looking over time from 1998 up to 2019. We have insecure households, somewhat secure, and more secure. So over here in 2019, 13% of households reported spending that exceeded their income, making them insecure. 37% had spending equal to their incomes and about 50% had spending less than their incomes. And we can see that since the Great Recession or so, level average levels of security with this measure have increased. So things have improved a bit, but generally there's not a ton of variation here over time. So this gives us some idea of economic insecurity over time. Let's take a look at some relationships in 2019 now. So let's actually bring in some models here where we wanna look at debt burdens and insecurity. And I'm showing you a few things in this graph. I'm showing you some predicted probabilities of ending up in one of three categories of being either insecure, these green dots, somewhat secure, these orange triangles, or more secure, these purple squares. And we're looking at this by comparing debt burden levels. So whether your debt was zero to 5% of your income or greater than 29%. So these are our less indebted households and our more indebted households up here. So we're looking across these debt burdens over rows, and I think we can start to see that as debt burden levels um, increase, as our debt increases, we see that in some cases insecurity increases. I think differences were really starkest when we look at these people in the fifth quintile, those that are really debt burdened. And here we see that uh, about 18% of these households were insecure, 43% were somewhat secure, and 40% were more secure. If we go up here and compare that to our least debt burden households, we see that only 11% of these households were insecure, 33% were somewhat secure, and 56% were more secure. And one of the interesting things here is we see some movement with our insecure category, but what we see is a lot of crossover once we start to think of the people who are just squeaking by and those who actually have money to put aside each month. So this first set of findings shows us that debt burden is associated with economic insecurity. And this is even after accounting for a variety of other credit and education and income and age factors. Now I want to think about what people actually do when they're faced with insecurity. So what strategies might they be implementing? Let's start here by comparing actual and hypothetical insecurity strategies across our insecure, somewhat secure, and more secure households. So we have these groupings across bars. And I'm giving this division over here because for our insecure households, we know what they actually did when they faced insecurity and their spending exceeded their income. For our somewhat secure and more secure households, we only know what they said they would do if they were put in this situation. And then we also have our different options. So our green bars are people who borrowed, our orange ones are those who spent from savings, and purple includes a lot of other categories. And we get to see the proportion of households using these different strategies. So if we look at these insecure households, 
we can see that about an equal percentage, about 44 to 45% of each borrowed and spent from their savings when they were faced with situations where their spending exceeded their incomes. And a much smaller percentage over here reported using other strategies. And for this group, most of the time, other strategies included falling behind on payments or cutting back on spending. The hypothetical strategies though, the things that people say they would do look a little bit different here. So if we look at our somewhat secure households, we see that about 18% said they'd borrow to make up the difference. 32% was spent from savings and about 50% said they would do something different. And within this category, the most common response was that they would work more or get an extra job. Differences in strategies were also pretty apparent with our more secure households where about 58% of these households reported that they would spend from their savings, only 8% would borrow, and another 34% would either get another job or cut back in different ways. So this comparison shows us that more secure households pro pro uh, propose relying on savings or finding additional income sources to make up the difference if they get into a situation of financial hardship. Other households though, we see that they kind of rely on a strategy of a mixture of different strategies. So this is starting to indicate to us that households who actually experience economic insecurity likely have very different strategies for managing their situations than those who are not likely to be exposed to it. So now to add just a tiny bit more variation here, I also wanna connect these strategies to debt burdens as well. So this graph again is very similar to the one from before and it's showing us some predicted probabilities again. So we're looking at outcomes as related to our insecurity strategies now. We've got our green circles for those who borrow, our, red, our orange triangles for those who spent from savings, and our purple squares for other things. And we're looking across debt burden. And again, we have our actual strategies and our hypothetical strategies over here. So if we're looking at our insecure group and our actual strategies, we don't necessarily see much variation across debt burden levels. We also see um, a lot of error around these estimates because this is a smaller size group. And in this case, we see most commonly we see these households borrowing, but a lot of them are spending from savings, not really doing much in terms of other types of strategies here, regardless of debt level. We do see slightly more differences across debt levels with our hypothetical households though, where our hypothetical situations. Um, where in this case, we see that those who have less debt are more likely to propose spending from savings as opposed to borrowing compared to those with most more debt. So this gives us some information about these different strategies and how they connect to that debt burdens. But let's just take a moment to get back to our dinosaurs and think about what this all actually means. So first, these results show us that this measure of insecurity is tied to household debt burdens. We can't say exactly how, but there is an association that holds after accounting for a variety of other factors. And generally households with the highest monthly debt burdens were more likely to experience insecurity. They were also more likely to borrow as an actual strategy for dealing with insecurity and propose borrowing as a hypothetical insecurity strategy. And second, these results also show us that the actual and hypothetical insecurity strategies really differ from one another. What secure households say they will do in times of insecurity differs a lot from what insecure households actually do when faced with situations where their spending exceeds their income. So this really affects people's views of how to deal with situations where you might be teetering off that edge. So how exactly are you going to deal with that fall? How might you want to deal with those dinosaurs? And I think this starts to highlight a lack of understanding about situations of financial insecurity by those households who are actually more secure. And I think this is something that's really important to consider when we start to think about policy proposals and public opinion around policy as well. So thank you all for having me today. Um, and yeah, I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Morado. Um, I'm uh, really enjoying this so far. I hope everybody who's here is enjoying this so far again. Uh, my name is Ted Sammons. I'm one of the co-organizers of the event with uh, Dr. Sherry Eli and Dr. David Petnikio. And it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Maggie Dickinson, who is an assistant professor of interdisciplinary studies at Gutman Community College at the City University of New York. Uh, Dr. Uh, Dickinson uh, published a book last year called Feeding the Crisis. Uh, this is about welfare, precarity, and supplemental nutrition assistance, uh, the SNAP program. 
Uh, it tells a story of eight families uh, as they navigate the terrain of the expanding network of assistance programs and so forth. Uh, her talk today is titled Feeding the Crisis, Welfare Precarity in the 21st Century United States. Uh, so it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Maggie Dickinson. Dr. Dickinson, thank you. Thanks, Ted. Hey, everybody. Um, thanks so much. I'm really happy to be here with all of you. I am learning so much from all these fascinating talks. Um, and as Ted said, I'm going to be talking a little bit about uh, my book, Feeding the Crisis. Um, but of course, you know, in this moment, uh, I think everything needs to be sort of recontextualized, right? Um, so what I'm going to be talking about a little bit are some of the larger arguments that I think are some of the preconditions, pre-existing conditions that are at play uh, in what we're seeing in the US right now, which is really just a monumental economic crisis. Um, and in particular, the failure to blunt the economic fallout um, from the pandemic. And you know, what I'll argue is that in part, what we're seeing today is the effect of a sort of decades long drive towards reconceptualizing the safety net in the United States in particular around this idea of work support. I mean, this, per, this uh, transformation is really particularly striking when we look at the food safety net in the US. Um, so I, I wanna think about that a little bit first. So um, since the turn of the 21st century, we have seen just an enormous outpouring of food assistance in the US. Um, that encompasses both federal food programs like SNAP, which used to be called food stamps, um, but also charitable food, um, soup kitchens and food pantries. So this is just to give you a sense of uh, the growth in the SNAP program, which really started you know, after welfare reforms were passed in around 2001 during the George W. Bush administration, you start to see the sort of rise in the food stamp rolls. Of course, this is under a Republican administration. A lot of this has to do with reduced administrative burdens, right? <laughs> see Pamela nodding. Um, but then in 2012, right, the recession hits and then you just see this astronomical increase in the SNAP rolls, they reached 47 million Americans in 2012. That's about 15% of the US population. So it's a huge number of people. And after the sort of official recovery, those numbers never really fell. Uh, they stayed very high. Typically, SNAP falls in line with unemployment. But you know, after the recession, we see this sort of divergence with SNAP rolls staying very high despite very low levels of unemployment. We also see something similar with charitable food. Uh, so in 2005, 25 million people accessed a soup kitchen or a food pantry. By 2012, that was 46.5 million people. And what we're seeing right now is that there has just been an astronomical growth uh, in the number of people who are accessing what we think of as emergency food or charitable food. Um, and despite this massive outpouring of food assistance, levels of hunger or food insecurity in the US have remained virtually flat since the USDA started collecting data um, on food insecurity about 25 years ago. Um, so all this help has not really made a dent in how many Americans are actually experiencing hunger. So my project is kind of doing a couple of things, um, trying to un untangle a couple of threads here. One is, you know, why hasn't the growing food safety net made a dent in hunger. Um, but the other one is this question of why food of all things has become kind of the go-to solution to poverty and economic insecurity in the United States. And then today, um, you know, where I wanna end up is just asking this question, where do we go from here? So I'm, I'm gonna sort of lay out um, some of the landscape and then think a little bit, I'd like to end on a little bit of a hope, hopeful note and thinking about where we could possibly go from here. So understanding the answers to some of these questions um, requires understanding what's been a fundamental transformation in the means-tested programs in the United States over the past few decades. Uh, the conventional wisdom is that welfare programs in the US have been continually cut back, they've been systematically dismantled you know, since the 1980s. But the expansion of food assistance tells a slightly different story, and I would argue actually a more accurate one. Um, so actually, what we've seen is that spending on what are often called the means-tested programs, programs that are targeted to low-income households, spending on those programs has been growing since the mid-1980s. And that growth has been targeted, right, very specifically targeted to the working poor, to people who are employed. 
So it's subsidizing low wages through programs like SNAP and the earned income tax credit, right? And what we've seen is a collapse in cash assistance for families, an increase in the EITC, which you can only get if you're working. And SNAP has also been transformed along these lines of work support. So just to look at this another way, uh, this is a poster that used to hang in the New York City welfare offices um, on the walls in the welfare office. And it's presenting this woman, Corinne, She's a mother of three, right? And the thing I'm interested in, and I'll use my arrow here to maybe help is this graph on the bottom. So it's presenting her income when she was on cash assistance on welfare, and it's below this poverty line here. So she was getting cash, child support collection and food stamps compared to when she got a full-time job, right? And once she gets a full-time job under this work category, uh, they're saying now she's lifted above the poverty line. Well, actually no, right? This bottom dark blue here are her wages, which are still below the poverty line. What's lifting her up above are all of these work subsidies, right? Food stamps and the earned income tax credit um, chief among those. So welfare reforms that were passed in the 1990s during the Clinton administration added work requirements that, you know, a lot of us know this history to both cash assistance and to food stamps pushing women off of the welfare rolls and into the labor market. And of course, the kinds of jobs that people were able to get were things like home health care aides, right? Care work of various kinds, taking care of children, um, looking after the elderly. And in the tight labor markets of the late 1990s, women found jobs, but they didn't find any relief from the very grinding poverty that they had known when they were on assistance. And so it was in this context that full-time working moms, people like Corinne, um, who are struggling to make ends meet, really emerged as a new kind of deserving poor. And what we've seen is that welfare spending and program administration since then have really been transformed to boost the value of these low those low wage workers' earnings. Um, so policymakers have really redesigned the social safety net to subsidize low-income workers. And at the same time, and this is also really key, increasingly to exclude people who are not employed. So there's two things happening here, right? Um, we've seen attempts to tighten work requirements for food stamps that happened in the last few rounds of the Farm Bill negotiations. Also, the Trump administration tried to do this administratively. Um, we've also seen additions of work requirements to programs like Medicaid. So increasingly access to SNAP, access to healthcare in a number of states in the US now is tied to being able to prove that you're employed. Um, so we're seeing you know, both the subsidizing of low wages, but also a growing number of people who are increasingly being excluded from social protections across the board, even minor things, healthcare, uh, food assistance. And of course, these recent moves uh, you know, around Medicare and um, you know, the work requirements around SNAP, they were opposed by center left policymakers, but they're really modeled on bipartisan welfare reforms that have made access to economic support increasingly dependent on employment. Of course, the real winners in this configuration are low wage employers who can pay their workers below subsistence wages, right? Um, and who have an increasingly desperate pool of laborers who will take any job under any conditions. And of course, what we're seeing right now in this pandemic is that when you have a safety net that's built around work in the context of mass unemployment, what you get is really a dire increase in poverty and precarity. Um, so of course, policymakers, many of them will argue that adding something like work requirements to SNAP or tightening them up is not a problem, right? Because there's all this other help. No one's gonna go hungry. Um, and they point to this enormous network of emergency food providers, soup kitchens, food pantries. This is Paul Ryan cleaning a clean pot. <laughs> It's a story for questions and answers if we wanna come back to it. Um, so they argue, right, that help should really be coming from the local community in these ways. And the problem with this story, of course, is that it's not really true. Um, the growth of the emergency food network across the US isn't just a sort of heartfelt response to local community needs. It's really been spurred on by federal funding. Um, emergency food constitutes in some ways a kind of third rail of the contemporary U.S. welfare state. So while you had soup kitchens and food pantries before 1980, they were typically very small. They didn't have regular or reliable state funds. 
Um, and then in 1983, Congress passed legislation that established what was called the Temporary Emergency Food Assistance Program, or TFAP. Um, TFAP provides funds and also distributes surplus commodities that the USDA buys up as a price support for farmers. Um, and it also gave money to local communities to uh, pay back some of the administrative costs of distributing these surplus commodities. So TFAP really became this incentive for communities all across the US so if they didn't have a food bank to establish one, right? Because there were these funding streams. So just to give you a sense, um, in New York City, the Food and Hunger Hotline, which was established in 1979, at that time, they were looking for all the emergency food programs they could find. So in all of New York City in 1979, there were 30. Today, there are over a thousand of them operating in New York City. There are 58,000 of these operating nationally, right? The growth in this field is actually pretty astounding. And it was state funding streams that really summoned all of these volunteers and all of these voluntary efforts into being. The reality is that most of these institutions really wouldn't be able to function without federal funding streams and state funding streams and particularly surplus commodities. They're also, of course, a key institution for managing the massive food waste in the United States. Um, and they're, one of the reasons why they're concerning is because they're not rights-based, right? There's all kinds of issues. They're not uniformly available. They're often open at odd hours and are not totally accessible. What we saw at the beginning of the pandemic is that many of these had to close because they depend on elderly volunteers who no longer felt safe going in to help out. Um, you know, and many of you, I'm sure, have seen lots of these pictures before, uh, but what we're seeing in the pandemic is that that's largely where the money for food and hunger support has gone. We've all seen these lines, long lines of cars lining up to get food. Um, so, you know, what we're seeing is sort of this shift to a kind of poor law tradition of kind of limited local charity, um, but it comes with all of these issues. Uh, so where do we go from here, right? This is sort of the landscape that we're operating in. Um, and obviously when we're thinking about precarity, hunger is clearly on the rise, particularly in the US. Uh, at the same time that we have a food system, you know, that produces far more food um, than we can eat in the US, food waste is a huge problem. We throw away 30 to 40% of the food that's produced in the United States. And yet when I was doing my research and I'm an anthropologist and was doing ethnographic work, I was meeting people before the crisis, before this current crisis, who were skipping meals to be able to make sure their kids had something to eat at the end of the day, right? Um, so what this all speaks to are the kinds of entitlement failures that exist in the US today. Um, people lack food because they can't adequately make and claim, uh, make a claim to the food that exists in the US context. And entitlement failure in the US is largely bound up in this notion that work is and should be the primary mechanism for distributing goods and services, right? So the right to food in many ways is tied to this obligation to work and that has intensified over the past 20 years. Um, however, we also know, right, in a panel about precarity that work has increasingly become an, in, um, a less effective system for distributing goods and services uh, in the latter half of the 20th century and into the 21st, right? Wages are low, work is more insecure. And I would argue actually that the expansion of the food safety net starting in the early 21st century is actually a political response to work as a failing system of distribution, right? When we think back to Corinne, um, those subsidies to, to labor are the state stepping in to hold workers afloat in a much more uncertain labor market. So fixing hunger and fixing precarity more broadly requires expanding people's entitlement to well-paid work through you know, potentially something like a jobs guarantee and also expanding access to the social wage outside of the obligation to work. So I wanna just think about this real quickly from a food systems perspective, right? Um, if we consider the job guarantee or something like it and what that would mean for the kind of food systems work that's necessary in the US today, it opens up all kinds of possibilities, right? Um, for establishing the kinds of public institutions that could really address so many of the problems that are at the heart of our current food system. Um, for example, we could transform the emergency food system uh, 
by basically paying people to do the work of cooking meals and feeding people, um, you know, that in the words of Coretta Scott King, create meaningful jobs uh, that serve human need, right? The insufficiency of food pantries is a direct result of the fact that they're structured as public-private partnerships that are designed to do more with less. But people can be paid to do the work of cooking meals and serving meals in their communities to meet a diverse range of needs. So not just people who are necessarily, you know, low income, but also rent burdened families, um, overworked parents. When I think about having to make dinner myself at the end of the day, having a, a low cost option is very appealing to me. Um, universal basic infrastructure along these lines is also really crucial for alleviating many of the care burdens that we've heard about today, um, particularly those faced by women and caretakers, which again, in this moment is just more and more vivid. My kids are next door and I'm hoping that they finish their school today. <laughs> um, so the infrastructure for food banks and food pantries, and you know, again, there's a lot of it. We're talking about trucks and warehouses and kitchens, right? Uh, could be mobilized to distribute sustainable local foods grown through urban agriculture, gardening programs that provide employment to young people or people who are interested in farming as a vocation. It could be deployed to improve school food, right? The list just kind of goes on and on. And of course, and I don't, I don't wanna downplay this, of course there are smaller reforms that of course would be also hard to achieve at this point, but things like getting rid of work requirements for SNAP or increasing SNAP benefit levels that would be very positive steps. But I don't believe that we're gonna be able to reform our way out of the current economic crisis. It's one that has been decades in the making, right? Instead, I think we need to radically rethink these institutions that are in place for meeting human needs. And so I'll leave it there. I look forward to the questions and the conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Maggie. You know, as somebody who studies um, early 20th century welfare, a lot of the themes, especially about food insecurity that you discuss are, you know, present today, present then, and, and need very radical changes. Thank you. Um, I, it's my great pleasure to introduce Trevon Logan. He is the Hazel C. Youngberg Distinguished Professor of Economics at Ohio State University. He's also Research Associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research and Director of a brand new working group that I'm really excited about, um, just announced a couple of days ago on race and stratification um, in the economy. Um, Trevon has a, a really large body of work and you can see on his website, um, but some of my fav favorite pieces that he um, has done really address uh, black politicians um, and uh, specifically um, the history and influence of, of black politicians in the US. So that's why I'm really delighted that today he's going to talk to us about precarity um, and how it's, it's shaped by a historical pattern of racialized violence in the United States. Um, and I think this is part of a really fascinating new agenda. Um, I'm also privileged to be his co-author um, as I've learned so very much from him and I'm, I'm, I know you will too and I'm so delighted to introduce him uh, to you all today. So Trevon, take it away. Uh, thank you, uh, Shari, this is uh, terrific. Yeah. This will work. Yeah. Okay. Um, I want to make a plug uh, for Boriana uh, Malacheva, who is a terrific graduate student that I've also been able to work with, who is at the University of uh, Toronto. But um, this talk is going to weave together um, a, a many of the pieces actually that we've talked about today um, and put them into uh, a much longer historical perspective and thinking about how our policies have evolved over time and really focus um, and create eight communities that live in a, a wide range of precarity. So we can start with the coronavirus pandemic uh, today, which has a lot of economic and racial disparities in the United States. If we're thinking about places where we can concentrate some of the racial disparity in the coronavirus pandemic, it is taking place in places that are disproportionately Black and places in the South, and so places in this, what we might call the African-American or rural uh, South. 
And if we think back broader to what is going on in the labor market now with the coronavirus pandemic, there are really two large effects. One is declining labor force participation. We know that a lot of women in particular are now leaving the labor market in response to school closures, being more likely to be in industries that have experienced substantial declines in demand because of the pandemic, et cetera. And this is changing the very nature of, of work. But even within that, there is another dimension of race where the labor force participation rates for African-Americans lag behind those of whites and the employment population ratio for blacks is also lower than it is for whites. So even within these larger moves in the economy, particularly in this pandemic, we see this cleavage of race and this dimension of race. It also affects when people receive benefits, even conditional on being able to qualify for the benefits. So if you're looking at this delay in the receipt of unemployment benefits between Blacks, Whites, and Hispanics in the United States, on average, African-Americans waited an additional week to receive unemployment benefits relative to Whites or Hispanics. And so this is conditional on them meeting, of course, the qualifications to apply for such assistance. And a week for someone who is in a precarious economic position could literally be the difference between food insecurity and having enough to eat, homelessness or potential eviction. And all of these will visit us again at the end of this year, even as the pandemic goes forward. The next piece of this is the link to food insecurity. So we've had, and we've had systemic differences in food insecurity by race over time, but this pandemic has exacerbated them dramatically. From the outsprung of the pandemic in the early spring, we now know that more than a quarter of households, of black households with children have food insecurity issues as of this summer. And that racial gap has continued. So the pandemic is not just something that has these racially disproportionate effects. The pandemic itself has actually exacerbated many of these differences, particularly along the dimension of race. In the summer, by July, the pandemic COVID-19 became the third leading cause of death for African-Americans. It is now the third leading cause of death in the United States generally, but literally more than a quarter before of the year before that, it was the third leading cause of death for African-Americans. So the racial disproportions in death, in hospitalizations, in needing uh, ventilation, in unemployment assistance gaps, in food insecurity, and in the locations and access to healthcare themselves have all actually been seeped in in this coronavirus pandemic. So the pandemic's disparities by race are really laced upon a deeper level of economic inequality, particularly by income and by wealth. And so what the pandemic has done is it's really seeped into America's racial inequality, which is deeply rooted in the American economy. So one reason why this has actually been exacerbated over time is because it can go in and literally get into something that has already been festering. If we look at racial income inequality in the United States, since the um, passage of the Civil Rights Act, 1964, essentially, we have not had and seen substantial gains in income uh, inequality in the United States. So if we're looking at the mean and if we're looking at the median over time, over more than a 50 year period, we see that we have not actually closed our racial income gap at the mean nor the median. So if we're thinking about economic disasters visiting populations, we have not had any closure between racial differences in income. We have actually had an exacerbation of differences racially by wealth. So at the very beginning, say, of the 1980s and the Reagan revolution, essentially the movement out of the federal distribution of anti-poverty programs to state block grant programs, 
the racial wealth gap stood at around $100,000 in constant dollars. And today, even in light of the Great Recession of the last decade, the racial wealth gap has now actually grown over time, even though there has been a diminution of white wealth at the median. So we can delve deeper into this racial wealth gap because it's very important. Wealth plays a very critical role in helping households not to be precarious. Households, for example, that have wealth are better able to sustain themselves through any economic shock. They're better able to liquidate assets because they have assets to in fact keep themselves sustained in periods of prolonged unemployment and the like. What we know is that Blacks have virtually no wealth to draw on in terms of a financial crisis and in times of a financial crisis. These studies that you'll see, for example, that talk about households who can meet a $400 expenditure without having to go and how would they do that if they had to go to a relative or someone else show distinct differences by race. So if we're looking at African-American wealth, when we exclude retirement savings, it's literally $25 of wealth. Whereas whites excluding retirement savings have $3,000. So there's no wealth that African-Americans have to sustain any economic collapse and certainly not one related to this pandemic. And there isn't a very simple solution to this racial wealth gap problem, which itself is an intergenerational problem and I'll speak about that. It is not the case that more educated African-Americans would be able, for example, to sustain these differences more than others. One of the most surprising results that comes out of this research by William Darity and Derek Hamilton and others who have investigated the racial wealth gap is that an African-American with a college degree has at the median less wealth than a white person who has not completed high school. So education itself is not going to help close this racial wealth gap. In fact, the African-Americans with college degrees, because they lack wealth, are more likely to have high levels of student debt, further diminishing their wealth position. Employment is similarly not the great equalizer. It is not about differences and these structural differences, say, in employment. Unemployed whites have significantly more wealth than African-Americans who are working full time. In fact, whites who are discouraged workers have nearly the same amount of wealth that African-Americans who are working full time have. So it is not a function of one's participation or attachment to the labor market. And family income is not the great equalizer either. Again, even for these households, these African-American households who are in the same income bin as white households, the gap actually increases over time. So it's not the case that these traditional mechanisms that we might think about, for example, investing in human capital, um, investing in employment opportunities, ending racial discrimination in the labor market, will solve this racial wealth gap. So at every level of family income, the racial wealth gap is acute. And again, to drive home this point about education, African-Americans with a college degree have less wealth than white Americans who have not completed high school. That is the contemporary picture of this racial wealth gap, but it has historical roots. And those historical roots are actually interlaced with violence. So there is the period that I'll talk about three of them, of reconstruction and Southern redemption, of lynchings and racial violence and in general Jim Crow racial terrorism. And then what I call the construction of modern American mobility, which is predicated on these systems. This is based upon some research I've done about African-American politicians. And this is the same region of the country that you were seeing before where we saw this concentrated poverty 
and where we saw this concentration of the COVID-19 pandemic. What you'll see here is that there was substantial political participation by African Americans in office holding from the time in which African Americans were first granted the franchise from the Reconstruction Act of 1867. That political participation by African Americans, my research has shown, had positive impacts on African American human capital acquisition, on economic position. They were less likely to be shareholders and much um, sharecroppers and much more likely to be tenant farmers. But that was met with a very violent backlash. Black politicians who advanced the most aggressive policies for wealth redistribution and for investment in public goods such as education were the most likely to be met with violence, literally physically run out of office, many times killed and other times threatened to be killed, for example, when they pursued these policies of racial equality. And what happened in a very short time span of this reconstruction period is that we would later see no variance in the tax policies by places that had had a black politician. This is critically important because it's showing that the way in which our public policies work can be undone through extrajudicial acts that limit democracy and full participation in the democratic system. So this move backwards to a very and highly unequal and racially segregated public policy structure began itself in the initial policies of reconstruction, which were designed to make investments in African-American human capital and to encourage wealth redistribution in the South. Later subsequent work has looked at the relationship between political competition and racialized violence in terms of lynching. And this result comes from work I've done with Lisa Cook and John Parman on segregation and lynching. And what we have found is that segregation in areas in which African-Americans and whites were racially separate from each other had higher levels of racialized violence in terms of lynching. It's very important to note that the only theory consistent with this empirical relationship is the political theory of lynching where lynching is used as a means of intimidating African-Americans from participating in the political process. This has actually been further supported by work by Jacobo Williams, who is looking at the relationship between racial violence and African-American participation in two independent time periods. This is the relationship between African-American political participation and historical lynchings, which we are counting for up until 1930, and this political participation coming from the late 1950s and early 1960s. Um, looking at this political participation, there's a negative relationship between lynching and political participation among African Americans. And this is immediately at the very beginning of the Civil Rights Era and the Voting Rights Act for African Americans. Lynching was very much about depressing African American political participation. It depresses African American political participation to this day. It is still the case that areas that had higher levels of lynching in 1890 and 1910 have lower rates of African-American voter registration today. That results in less political participation by African-Americans and less political representation for them, even in the very simplest model of outcomes. In some later work with Bradley Hardy and Jacoba Williams, we've investigated the relationship between lynching at the state level and government assistance programs. Areas that have high levels of lynching are less likely to have minimum wages above the federal minimum wage. They're more likely to have higher unemployment rates and they have less generous state earned income tax credit policies. This should not happen if there was no relationship, for example, between the politics and our public policy and historical racial violence, but there is a relationship between public policy and historical racial violence. If we're looking at communities where we see the lack of business dynamism and how it varies in these rural communities, I want to call your attention to this work by the Center for American Progress on this absolute lack of business development in an area that we're calling the African-American South. This is the rural South of the United States, the same area that I was showing you earlier that had really high levels of racial disproportionality in COVID-19. 
These areas continue to be to this day in this century economically depressed and have lost more businesses than any other type of rural community in the United States. It is also the case that these same areas are the ones that have the highest levels of economic distress and the highest percentage of their zip codes classified as being economically distressed. This area of the country is a concentration of racialized precarity created by construction of historical processes which continue to play out in this region of the country, which still houses a large number of African-American people. And then we can think about intergenerational mobility. So this result comes from the very famous Chetty um, mobility studies looking at intergenerational mobility by race. And the lowest rates of intergenerational mobility are amongst African Americans nationally. And the way that they measure inter intergenerational mobility is looking at the rank of a child in the income distribution as a function of the parent's income rank. And what you'll notice is that a parent at the 20th percentile of the income distribution does not result in a child substantially increasing their economic position um, and less in among African-Americans than among any other racial group. This is also exacerbated by race. This shows the um, same relationship on a map. This is the mean income rank for black children growing up in a household at the 20th percentile of the income distribution. And these lighter colors mean that there is a lower level of intergenerational mobility for African-Americans. And again, you'll see the same area of the country has the lowest level of intergenerational mobility for African-Americans. This is a contemporary evidence of this long run process, which was mediated by racialized violence and continues to have impact today. This is the lynchings in the same time period that I'm showing you this economic precarity in terms of intergenerational mobility. These are the same regions of the country where we see this lack of business dynamism and where we see this low level of intergenerational mobility. Even further, these communities have the lowest rates of intergenerational mobility among any rural community in the United States today. The African-American South, which was originally a place of Black political participation, which was met with violence, heightened racialized violence in the terms of lynchings, which was also a political process, have lower rates of political participation today, and have low rates of mobility at present, are all taking a part of this long run historical process. It is not only something that is a function of the economy, it is very much a function and part of the political process as well. And this is a historical perennial. So the intergenerational mobility that Chetty documents for children born in the early 1980s has been extended by Bill Collins and Marianne Wanamaker to the entire 20th century. These low rates of economic mobility for African-Americans relative to whites are a long run historical process. So when we think about precarity amongst groups, it is important to understand that this is a process that is not only something that is a function of our modern politics, but is in fact a historical process whose current outcome was actually preceded by deliberate planning, strategy, and execution to in fact exclude members from the economy and from prosperity. Thank you, Trevon. Um, I'll turn it over to Ted, who I think will lead a little bit of a discussion. Yeah, sure. I'm, uh, th this was just all terrific. Thank you all. Uh, thank you, Dr. Logan. Thank you, Dr. Dickinson, Dr. Hur, Dr. Cranford, Dr. Morado. This was just fantastic. Uh, there's um, one note that I need to make that because this is a monk sponsored event and because it's being recorded, uh, we're being kicked out of the room as it were at three minutes after four o'clock. So unfortunately, uh, we've all got to talk either at the same time or very, very quickly 
uh, to say all the stuff that we would probably like to say to one another. But we have had um, David Petnikio, Dr. Petnikio had been looking at the Q&A and had noted that there were a couple of, of questions. Uh, there was a, a, a first question came very early. In fact, as soon, I wonder if you all on the panel, this is just an admin thing, but um, we had a question. As soon as Dr. Cranford started working, someone jumped on the chat and said, I love these slides. Will we be able to sending these great looking slides afterward? Uh, so I, I want to just put that that bug in y'all's ear that you have people in the audience that are clamoring for uh, for your visual aids. And I will um, I will let you pause and think about what you'd like to do with that uh, while I move on to the other question. There was another question that someone asked. Uh, oh, in fact, I'm sorry. I just noticed that um, Dr. Morado had already uh, been able to engage with this person on the on the Q and A. May I just ask if there are anybody in the audience right now? I want to make sure to invite you all. Please use the Q and A. Uh, the Q and A uh, is open, and and please feel free to just type us a question. Um, but David, you had said uh, you had been interacting with some folks before. I wonder if you have any sense of uh, some questions that have been kind of lingering in the air. I have, I have my own, but I want to let. Uh, I, I should sit on my hands. Uh, well, I guess what one. I mean, I don't know if it's a, so much a question, but or a comment is sort of I. You know, in listening to all the um, talks, there's so much in common in these, in, in this kind of research that addresses both kind of a kind of an institutional structural problem, but also kind of a very there's also an underlying sort of cultural attitudinal sort of aspect to this. And I'm just wondering what now that the panelists have listen to each other's work if you were in agreement with me or if you had anything to share any kind of uh final thoughts in this sort of now broader context of having listened to 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 these great presentations i just seems to me that there's so much in common here uh despite different academic orientations and whatnot um i i i, I know that we put the panel together but i'm actually pretty um, so, I mean, I'm pretty surprised as to how common our perspectives are on this, I, I, it seems. I, I would just say there were a couple of things that stood out to me in the other talks that connected with things I'm thinking about. So Maggie's focus on the shift to work requirements. Mm. Um, and so we have kind of focused on that quite a bit, in part because um, they just add extraordinary burdens to these programs. So when they experimented with the work requirements in Arkansas, for example, I mean, effectively, most people kicked off the program in Arkansas actually qualified. <laughs> so there's like the problem, like just theoretically and inherently with work requirements, and then there's the administration of them. And there's just so much evidence. It's, it just introduces a lot of chaos into these programs in addition to the um to that so that that was definitely one thing that stood out to me listening to her uh listening to her talk um and i was struck by Trevon's talk too and pointing out um what's been going on with ui and the degree to which those patterns are pattern the um, burden patterns in ui but this holds in different ways across different programs as well are, are really racialized basically um, in their distribution and impact. We have a, a question from uh, Sarah um, in the q and I can read it out and, um, it, and uh, she prefaces by saying it's a big question, uh, but would love to hear one thing for policy people to focus on going forward. <laughs> Knowing all of this, what should we do now? <laughs> Maggie, you had had a particular part. <laughs> Sorry, Maggie, Dr. Dickinson, you had had you had addressed this in your paper particularly. I don't know if you want to say one or two words about that or, or recapitulate some of what you said about what is to be done. Um, it is a big question. It's a good question. But I, I also just wanted to say uh, in response to Pam's point um, around work requirements and particularly in response to Dr. Logan's work, you know, the other thing that we see is that those places where work requirements have been um, introduced or are, you know, most effective at excluding people are also in that same geographical area uh, that Dr. Logan was talking about and are explicitly, you know, 
tied to race. So, you know, the work of Joe Sauce and others have looked at how work requirements and the sanctions associated with work requirements are more harsh, uh, more exclusionary in places with higher uh, rates of African-Americans in poverty in those, in those communities. So there's quite a lot of connections. Um, you know, but I think uh, in terms of what to do, I, I think there is a lot of work in terms of understanding the Yeah. ways that you know various groups in society because of the way that their positions see the world differently oh i think i'm unstable so i think that's also just a very ripe place for kind of asking these questions or how people's views are shaped by their positionality and i think there was a lot that was sort of touched on um, in the presentations today on that from, from my perspective there's there are actually i you know i presented and taught and emphasized the sort of political um, the way that politics shapes these burdens and trying to address it via like politics. But to be fair, there, frankly, there are a lot of uh, burdens embedded in programs where it's uh, incompetence might be harsh, but where it's in states like states like Minnesota, for example, that are more progressive um, politically, um, but they have these programs that just aren't well run. <laughs> Um, so there is room. California is super striking in this way. Actually, California has one of the most burdensome SNAP programs in the country. But like it is ideologically, it doesn't make sense. You know, it, um, so there is this sort of mismatch um, where there is room to do this. I would actually argue that one of the things that this is something the Biden administration should focus on right away because it's going to be difficult to do things congressionally, but they have a lot they have a lot of things that they can do in the executive branch to roll back this stuff. UI, UI is so understudied from my perspective. The, the kind of racialized nature of UI, the burdens in it, like there's, it's just really um, understudied, but like a uh, huge place for improvement. I'll just uh, say a Please. few things about the two questions. One, some similarities that struck me in, in these very different disciplinary backgrounds and different kinds of studies and levels of analysis is that clearly understanding precarity is about um, looking at people's location within multiple policy and political that are often seen as silos, right? And not only do you have the multidimensional, you know, notion of precarity as, you know, lack of regulatory protection, but also enforcement of the laws that are on the books, plus income and wealth at individual and household levels. Um, but you also have people, I was really struck with you know, all the presentations of people who were, um, you know, the, the policy kind of silos do not fit with people's realities. And much of their precarity is that it seeps into, I, I'm now saying uh, Dr. Logan, so, so COVID is seeping into these historical, you know, inequalities, but you can see that across these multiple fields, right? And so that really struck me sort of listening to the, the presentation. I think as at risk of a non-policy um, person asking a policy question, it's also what needs to be done from my perspective is not just innovative forms of legislation like I talked about with IHSS that move beyond the kind of standard employment relationship based on a factory model that actually gets at the reality that people have multiple jobs and they, they span these multiple sectors and their precarity is highly racialized and gendered. But we also need ways to enforce any kind of um, you know, laws on the books and policy on the books. And that's where I see social movements coming in that so in the conclusion of my book, I look at what sort of very grassroots groups are doing, independent living centers, um, community uh, labor, um, labor centers, um, immigrant uh, organizations, and they're doing some really innovative work, I think, to look at um, precarity and all its complexity like the panel talked about. So thank you for that. Dr. Morado, would you like to, uh, anything on the tip of your tongue that you'd like to, to share, or even Dr. Logan also, things that you didn't have, uh, comments that come up with this part of the conversation? Dr. Morado, I kind of gestured at you, so I'm putting you on the spot if there's anything you'd like to say. 
Um, I think I just really have to echo what Cynthia had to say. So these talks today, they all come together to show that precarity is in so many different areas. It's in so many different parts of life. And we can think about policies that apply to these different areas as well. But I think we also have to think about activism too, because these things don't exist just out of the blue completely randomly. They exist because certain people wanted them to happen and people in power want them to continue. So I think that's where we also have to think about activism with policy as well. Dr. Logan, Sherry, David, Dr. Logan. I, I think I'll just say that um, when we talk about precarity, I think we really have to uh, understand that it's something that is constructed in a particular society and it's something that happens over time. And it's something that is happening and that occurs on purpose, right? So I think our, our public discourse typically wants to think about this as being unlucky or something that is just by happenstance. But many of these are actually systems that are built and that change over time to adapt and to exploit certain groups of people. And we see that in the changes that have happened um, with the social safety net. And so I think taking a long lens of this allows people to see that much more than just a current sort of administrative rule from the Trump administration. This is a process that began before the Clinton administration. It's a process that began before um, either Bush administration. This is a long-standing policy of how we deal with people who are in economically impoverished um, positions and how we've changed our minds about how and who is deserving of assistance and how that assistance would be delivered. I think uh, on that wonderful note, we could uh, or we should conclude it's four o'clock and I don't want to interfere with the next um, session either, but um, this was fantastic. I, I learned so much. I feel that this work is so important. It was important before. It's important now and it'll be even probably more important as we move towards some sort of recovery from the effects of COVID. And um, so I, I really want to thank our panelists for joining us. Um, just terrific. And to all the, the folks who attended, um, thank you. And thank you for the, the questions in the Q&A were great. Um, so um, safe, have a safe weekend. And to American friends, next week is Thanksgiving, right? So have a safe Thanksgiving. Um, and uh, let's keep in touch. Thank you all. Thanks, you all. Thank you so much. Stay safe. Nice